It's just a bit, oh look, I help the peasants. Aren't I lovely? I'm going to have it. And I'm... Welcome to McBurdo's expedition into the unknown and terrible. We have been stuck here in the ice for an eternity. Come into the captain's cabin and warm yourself. Welcome to my cabin. How long have we been trapped in this infernal ice pack? Or in the summer, tropical estuary. Today I shall read to you from my selection of innumerable primary sources, because the past said it better. Writers can embellish on a story that they've heard, but hearing the words of someone who actually witnessed an event sometimes shocking always amazing i have not read this before so we're going to experience it together i'm going to break in with my opinions chances are as you are a crew member of the hms miser you are not easily upset by the dark and terrible none of these are very happy the odd one is it's a surprise I will warn you now that these may not have the most politically acceptable ideas or language because they come from the past and things were different then. So make yourself comfy, grab yourself a suitable beverage, and let us block out this howling wind together. Hello and welcome back. You can meet the newest member of the crew. This is Rothgar, King of the Snows. And uh, we found him out wandering the ice and he just had to join us. Woo! <laughs> Woo! So today we are going to talk about one of my, shall I say favorite things? Not favorite things. Something that's going to feel pretty familiar, I think, to many of us soon. The Bonus Army and the Great Depression. Someone's attacking my feet. The King of the Snows likes feet. I've always found the Bonus Army really fascinating because the World War I veterans were promised a bonus for their service and it was to be paid out in the 1940s, but they were literally starving in the 1930s, so they demanded their bonus. And I find it very hard to blame them. And it's quite interesting because some of the, we'll say, monsters on the military end of the Bonus Army story would go on to become massive heroes in World War II, like Douglas MacArthur. In particular, I find Douglas MacArthur a pretty interesting person. And if I'm going to be honest, just the littlest bit yummy in his youth. There's a picture of him in World War I. Ooh, before the corn cob pipe. Mm -hmm. Made a big difference. This story is from Evelyn Walsh McLean, and it's from her book, sort of inappropriately titled Father Struck It Rich. And it's about her life. And she was uh, an interesting person. She was the wife of the owner of the Washington Post. She was a huge mover and shaker in Washington, DC. She knew everybody, you know, uh, she was a real socialite. Her father was enormously wealthy. And she talks about when she first saw the Bonus Army. And I think it's a really wonderful description of them. So let's see what she has to say. On a day in June 1932, I saw a dusty automobile truck roll slowly past my house. I saw the unshaven, tired faces of the men who were riding in it standing up. A few were seated at the rear with their legs dangling over the, the lowered tailboard. On the side of the truck was an expanse of white cloth on which was crudely lettered in black, Bonus Army. Other trucks followed 
in a straggling succession on Massachusetts Avenue where stroll most of the diplomats and other fashionables of Washington were some ragged hikers wearing scraps of old uniforms. The sticks on which they strode along seemed less like canes and more like cudgels. They were not a friendly looking lot and I learned they were hiking and riding into the capital along each of its radial avenues, that they had come from every part of the continent. It was not lost on me that those men, passing any one of my big houses, would see in such rich shelters the kind of challenge. 2020 was a mockery of their want. I was burning because I felt that crowd of men, women and children should never have been permitted to swarm across the continent. But I could remember when those same men with others had been cheered as they marched down Pennsylvania Avenue. When I recalled those wartime parades, I was reading in the newspapers that the Bonus Army men were going hungry in Washington. That night, I woke up before I had been asleep an hour. I got to thinking about those poor devils marching along the Capitol. I decided that it should be a part of my son Jock's education to see and try to comprehend that marching. It was one o'clock and the Capitol was beautifully lighted. I wished then for the power to turn off the lights and use the money thereby saved to feed the hungry. She's not all bad. Oh, let's just turn off the lights. Oh, use my money, which might be a bit of a challenge. Like, don't look at my money. Does this sound at all familiar? If I could just turn off the lights, I could feed these hungry people. Or I probably have enough money. I could feed them for a few days myself. No, 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 we'll turn off the lights and do it. <sighs> when Jock and I rode among the bivouacked men, I was horrified to see the plain evidence of hunger on their faces. I heard them trying to cage cigarettes from one another. Some were lying on the sidewalks, unkempt heads pillowed on their arms. I've sat on a sidewalk. It wasn't nice. It was really cold. And that was in the middle of summer, but it was in the middle of the night. There's a story there. It involves some Star Wars movies. I'm not going to elaborate. I'm a nerd. <laughs> Leave me be. A few clusters were shuffling around. I went up to one of them, the fellow with eyes deeply sunken into his head. Have you eaten? He just shook his head. Just then I saw General Glassford, superintendent of the Washington police. He said, I'm going to get some coffee for them. All right, I said, I'm going to Child's. I don't know what Child's is. Maybe we'll find out. Yay! It was two o'clock when I walked into that white restaurant. A restaurant! Hooray! A man came up to take my order. Do you serve sandwiches? I want a thousand, I said, and a thousand packages of cigarettes. Get them, my good man. Off you go. Off, off. Get me sandwiches and cigarettes. But lady, and I want them right away. I haven't got a nickel with me, but you can trust me. I'm Mrs. McLean. Oh, it's only a truly wealthy and somewhat out of touch person can do. Off with you, peasant. Go get me sandwiches and cigarettes. And bring me one. Well, he called the manager into the conference and before long they were slicing bread with a machine. And what with Glassford's coffee also, he was spending his own money. We fed, we too, fed all the hungry ones who were in sight. The next day I went to see Judge John Burton Payne, head of the Red Cross, but I could not persuade him that the Bonus Army men were part of a national crisis that the Red Cross was bound to deal with. He did promise a little flower, and I was glad to accept it. Actually, to be fair, I think she is making a fair amount of effort and a lot more than many wealthy people in Washington were making at that time. So I take back some of my snark. 
Then I tried the Salvation Army and found that their girls were doing all they could. I asked the officer in charge, a worried little man, if he could undertake to find out how I could help the men. With enthusiasm, he said he would, and the next day came to my house to tell me what the bonus army leaders said that they most needed was a big tent to serve as a headquarters. You know, I can't help but have the, again, somewhat snarky uh, thought that her husband owns a big newspaper and now she's feeding the news. Now, I'm, I'm sure that it's out of more better feelings, but still. Um, am I horrible? I might be a little bit. In which fresh arrivals could be registered. At once, I ordered a tent sent over from Baltimore. Get tent, peasants. After that, I succeeded in getting Walter Waters to come to my house. He was trying to keep command of that big crowd of men. I talked to him and before long we were friends. Hello, rich lady. I'll be nice to you to get your money. Hello, peasant. You're probably useful to me in some way, so I shall listen to your problems and feel most altruistic. Mm. I sent books and radios to the men. I went to the house in Pennsylvania that Glassford had provided for the women and children. There was not a thing in it. Scores of women and children were sleeping on the floors. So I went out and bought them army cots. Another day, I took over some of my son's clothing, likewise, some of my own, and dresses of my daughter. One of the women held up one of little Evelyn's dresses and examined it on both sides. Then she said, I guess my child can starve in a $50 dress as well as in her rags. Yeah, that one's tough because, you know, if all of a sudden the bonus army children show up and they're in exceptionally fine clothing, people will be like, yes, but you're not poor, are you? And again, I, I can't help but think that some of these bonus army women are going like, Lady, why are you bringing this? But okay. One day Waters, the so-called commander, came to my house and said, I'm desperate. Unless these men are fed, I can't say what won't happen to this town. With him was his wife, a little 93 pounder. <laughs> Hello, little 93 pounder. Oh. Do I approve? Do I not approve? I can't tell. Dressed as a man, her legs and feet in shiny shoes. Her yellow hair was freshly marcelled. Oh, well, maybe she's got some money. She's not been on the road for days, said Waters, and has just arrived by bus. I thought a bath would be a welcome change, so I took her upstairs to the guest room my father had designed for King Leopold. I sent for my maid to draw a bath and told the young woman to lie down. You get undressed, I said, and while you sleep, I'll have your things cleaned and pressed. Oh no, she said, not me. I'm not giving these clothes up. I might never see them again. Her lip was out, so I did not argue. She threw herself down on the bed, boots and all, and I tiptoed. That night, I phoned to Vice President Charlie Curtis. I told him I was speaking for Waters, who was standing by my chair. I said, these men are in a desperate situation, and unless something is done for them, unless they are fed, there is bound to be a lot of trouble. They have no money, nor any food. Charlie Curtis told me he was calling a secret meeting of senators and would send a delegation of them to the House to urge immediate action on the Howell Bill providing money to send the bonus army members back to their homes. Those were the times I often wished for the days of Warren Harding. Harding would have gone among those men and talked in such a manner to make them cheer him and cheer their flag. Yeah, yeah. I, Warren Harding would have been like, yes, yes, poor starving buggers who need your bonus money or your children are literally going to die. I'm not going to give it to you, but... If Hoover had done that, I think not even troublemakers in the swarm could have caused any harm. <laughs> Having said that, I do have some thoughts. This is so naive. But then, you know, sometimes the president has shown up for things and everybody's like, Oh my god, it's him! Oh, we'll stop. 
Nothing I had seen before in my whole life touched me as deeply as what I had seen on the faces of those men of the Bonus Army. Their way of writing things was wrong. Oh yes. But it is not the only wrong. I had talked to them and their women. Even when the million dollar home my father built was serving as some sort of headquarters for their leader, I could feel and almost understand their discontent and their hatred of some of the things I have represented. Oh, really? Really? This kind of makes me think of some of the Hollywood stars who are like, yes, yes, I'll take in refugees. Of course I will. In my third best house in the country that I never go to. Sometimes I let my family stay there, but they don't like it either. But it's such a bad market. I won't sell it right now. So uh, <laughs> for some refugees, like it's just, it's well-meaning, but it's just, Ah, it's out of touch. It's, it's something I, I don't quite know. I just kind of want to shake her and then go, but you tried and, and that's positive. I was out in California when the United States Army was used to drive them out of Washington. In a moving picture show, I saw in a newsreel the tanks, the cavalry and the gas bomb throwers running those wretched Americans out of our capital. I was so raging mad I could have torn the theater down. They could not be allowed to stay, of course, but even so I felt myself one of them. After that, I concluded it was high time the family of Tom Walsh went back to work. And there we go. I'm conflicted. I am. You know, on one hand, I think that she's completely out of touch and needs a bit of a slap. And on the other hand, I'm like, she's trying. She did more than a lot of other people did, so I can't be horrendously mad at her. You mad at me? <laughs> mad? Nah, nah, but I ain't mad. Uh -huh. But I'm a bit... The, the irritation is there. I think I think it was interesting. Sadly, it's just it's just a bit. Oh look, I helped the peasants. Aren't I lovely? I'm going to heaven, and I was one of them. Me was never starved a day in my life, and whose children's old clothing are fifty dollar dresses. And I mean that's fifty dollars in 1936, or well 1932. So the height of the depression. That's probably like a. $300 dress or $400 dress? Let me look it up. Five minutes later. <laughs> a $50 dress would be a $1,000 dress. So it's like handing some poor person your baby Prada and saying, here, I'm donating clothing to help your children. Oh, aren't I lovely? Aren't I the noblest of souls? Yes. So, the bonus army. I'll have to find more. I mean, that was good, but more about the people and the raid on Anacostia is just like, <clears throat> if you haven't heard about that, I totally recommend you look it up. Fifty dollars in nineteen thirty two. 